Hi, everyone. Uh, <laughs> yeah, let's clap. Let's have some energy. I love that between every performer, there's like the saddest music. Like we killed the idea when the person left. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, your next speaker, I'm very excited. We have from the president of Find the Best, Yabin, Rabin Yagubi. Hello. Hello, Brooklyn. Uh, my name is Rabin Yagubi. I'm the president of Find the Best. Find the Best is an unbiased, data-driven comparison engine. We have over 700 topics, ranging from ski resorts to dog breeds, smartphones, baby strollers, colleges, where we take a lot of unbiased data, combine it with expert reviews to give users tools for them to make better decisions. Um, in the spirit of today's topic, redefining better, I'm going to talk about being smarter about data to make decisions. But before I do that, I want to ask you a question. Would you rather I tell you more about Find the Best, who we are, and what we do? Or would you rather I talk about sex, booze, politics, and marijuana? Boring corporate presentation, raise your hands. All the things you're not supposed to talk about on the first date, raise your hands. That's shocking. I'm going to make five observations and, uh, and elaborate on those. The first one is one I'm sure all of you can relate to. We're not in the information age. We're in the way too much information age. In fact, digital content is exploding. Some statistics show that there is more than double as much content today, this year, than there was last year. And the pace of that growth is only accelerating which in a sense is great. We're generating a lot more content, there's a lot more information, is a lot more accessible, and everybody today uses the internet to make decisions. Whether it's where to take your family on vacation, or what car or camera to buy. There's only one problem. There's so much information now that it's become increasingly difficult to find what you're actually looking for. So let me give you an example. Marijuana. Something some of you might be somewhat or more intimately familiar with. But I'm talking about the legal, medical kind. If you live in California, where they have dispensaries for legal, medical marijuana, and you want to find out who can deliver it at 4.20 p.m., you can go to Google and search. And this is what you'll find. Over a million results. And it'll take you a long time to actually find that dispensary that can deliver marijuana, for medical purposes only, of course, to you um, through looking at search engines. But what if you could take a tool that has done all this work for you, that has taken all this data, organized it, and gives you the information that you need? And that is exactly what we do. We, when we look at a topic, we research what are the attributes by which people make decisions on that topic. We then take data from multiple sources, organize it, and present it through filters to users so they can make the best decision for them. And that really helps break through the clutter of all the information on the internet. Which takes me to my second point. Open and available does not equal discoverable and usable. Let's take government data or data of public organizations. They sit on tons and tons of incredibly interesting and valuable information. And for years they've been hoarding it. But they're increasingly under pressure to make that information available to the public. It's our information. It's been paid for by taxpayers. And increasingly they are making that information available. But here's another problem. I'll give you the example of Section 8 housing. For those of you who don't know, it's a program by the Department of Housing and Urban Development to help low-income individuals find affordable housing. And they have a lot of data on Section 8 housing, locations, is it for families or single individuals. Here's what it looks like. It's completely unstructured. It's messy. It's basically useless. 
And so like the tree that falls in the forest, you know, there's no one there. Uh, does it actually exist? No one can hear it. Similarly, this data is useless if it's in this unstructured form. But if you can take it and actually structure it, then you can make it powerful and you can make it empowering. And you can turn data into knowledge. Let me give you another example. Investment banks, very popular industry these days. Investment banks are highly regulated, so they say. And increasingly, they have to disclose information on all the investment managers that work there. Anything from their backgrounds, their education, right down to the, to the tests that they've taken and whether they've passed those tests or not. And what we've done is actually rank investment banks by the number of investment advisors working for them that have failed securities exams more than once. It's important information to know when you're deciding who to give your cash to. My next point is that structuring data requires an element of scalable human curation. There's been many different attempts to organize the web. Technology, algorithms, semantic. There's open data sources where people dump all their data, expecting that it magically organizes itself. And these are all viable and reasonable approaches. But you can't really get clean, usable data unless you involve some level of human curation. How many people in this room are Republican? Raise your hand. I don't blame you if you don't. It's Brooklyn. But if, what if you were Republican and you wanted to compare the candidates for the presidency side by side? You wanted to know who they are and what they stand for. You could research this for hours. But by combining technology and human curation, what we call technology-assisted human curation, we've been able to pull data from public sources, voting records, candidate websites, in order to give users a very factual side-by-side -side comparisons of all the candidates and help them make a decision. My fourth point is about expert and social advice as key elements of the decision-making process. If you think about how we make decisions, there's basically three steps. We gather all the facts, we look to the experts, and we ask our friends and family, and thereby make a decision. I've talked a lot about facts and data, so let me talk about experts and social. Experts are important, they're authorities. But one individual expert always has some inherent bias. US News tells you this is the best college. They have chosen some criteria by which they weigh and decide what defines best. Similarly, if CNET tells you this is the, ca the best camera, they have their way of deciding what it is. So there's always some bias. It's always uh, uh, arbitrary to some extent, even though it's an authority. But what if you took many, many experts and aggregated those. Then you get kind of the wisdom of crowds effect. You get the wisdom of experts. And you eliminate that, some of that bias. That's why if you go to Rotten Tomatoes or Metacritic to see what movie is good, they usually write. Because they don't rely on one expert, they rely on many. And this is exactly what we do for products and services. We take multiple different reviews from multiple different sources. We weigh them. We normalize them to give you one, what we call a smart rating. And when we start comparing those smart ratings to the actual data, you see some really interesting correlations. For example, we have a comparison of wines. And we've seen that there's a very high correlation between wine and latitude. And that the best wines come 35 degrees north or south of the equator. Even more interesting, at least for me, is comparing expert ratings on vodka with price. There is no correlation. In other words, a more expensive vodka doesn't mean it's any better. So you might as well buy the cheap stuff, it's gonna taste just as good, and it's gonna get you just as drunk. 
The third element of decision making is social. And that's both the interest graph, as it's called, and the social graph. So Amazon has been doing this for years through collaborative filtering, recommending products to you based on what like-minded people are buying. And increasingly with platforms like Twitter and Facebook, you can actually engage your own social network into the decision-making process. So let's say I want to buy a new phone. I'm choosing between an iPhone and an Android phone. I narrowed down to two choices. I post it, and I let my friends help me decide which of the two I should choose. My final point, and probably the most important one, is that everyone has a different better. Everyone has their own preferences and their own tastes. And when you go on the internet, you see a lot of sites that tell you top 10 of this, top 100 of that, best of that. But what is best for you doesn't necessarily mean it's best for me. And we see that when we analyze the number of filters that people use across our comparison. So let's say dog breeds. When we look at dog breeds, people choose nine different filters. Everything from uh, life expectancy, is it good for my child, size, is it difficult to groom. Buying a dog is a very highly considered decision. So giving people the filters to be able to choose which dog is right for them helps them make that decision. My last example is probably the most personal decision of all. Love. How many people here use or have used a dating site? Don't worry, there's no stigma. So if you're looking for the right dating site, and more and more people are using them to find love, as well as other things, you can go on Google, and you can check best dating site. You get over 350 results, million results, sorry. You get a lot of advertisers screaming for your attention. You get what we call affiliate shields, people that tell you they're the best, that they either have their own ranking mechanism or have advertisers pay to rank them. And none of this is really personalized. But let's say you took all this information and you put it in a format where you let people decide what is most important to them. What ethnicity or sexual orientation, size, size of membership, not size of member, age, and education. And by doing that, really give people the tools to find what is best for them and make the internet smarter. I'm going to leave you with one last comparison before I finish. Uh, we have a comparison on TED Talks, where we've taken all the TED Talks and ranked them by social signals. Uh, tweets, Facebook likes, Reddit shares and comments. And we're going to take all of the ones from today and include them in this comparison as well. So I encourage you to share them and tweet them so that Brooklyn is well represented and gets the props it deserves. I hope you enjoyed my little talk about sex, booze, and drugs. I'd like to thank TEDx Brooklyn for having me, and I'd like to thank you for your time and attention.